Mr. Aubrey Bratton, lead us in a word of prayer, please. Psalms 51, 
covenant we're going to deal with that in another psalm of David when he's dealing with restoration after a fall in the sin. So, Mr. Will, if you got 32, 1 through 7. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I keep silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. See the line. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. See the line. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters, they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Selah. Right. When you look at that psalm, it may, it may uh, tell you, it may tell us, it is the psalm of David. It is a, a poem as such, and it's a poem of what? The Bible may say that, in contemplation. What David is doing, he is looking over this time in his life when he fell in sin, or fell to temptation, <laughs> fell into sin, and he's experiencing and telling for us, and I appreciate the fact that, that David is telling us a personal experience of his life. And he's going over that with us to tell us and to help us because he knows we're human and that we will sin. If you look at Psalms 51, you'll see the same thing. David, again, it's dealing with that sin that he, he fell into temptation, that sin after he had uh, gone into Bathsheba. And at verse 1, he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. There's that word again. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You'll see that he mentions three words in Psalms 32. He mentions it, those three words again. In Psalms 51, we're going to look at those three words. Psalms 32 has a, a, uh, a sense of, uh, of the gospel. It's amazing to me that these Old Testament saints had a picture, although it may have been vague, they had a picture of the good news of the gospel. Because they knew that God was a good God, that He was a merciful God, that He was a kind God, and that He moved in grace with us. He did it salvation. It took a load of grace, if you would, for us to come to Him and for Him to forgive us our sins. But He does that over and over and over again. It doesn't stop the salvation. And so He, he begins to deal with those things. Uh, and in 32, it's more evident than in Psalms 51. But he's telling us there is good news in Jesus Christ from the minute we are saved to the minute we pass away and go to be with him forever. There is goodness and mercy and divine grace in God through Jesus Christ. And David felt that. He felt that. So what I want to do is uh, in verses 1 and 2, I want us to look at those. He's going to tell us and describe for us the sinner in these three, three areas of his life. But I want you to pay attention. Not only does he do that, David does that, that he describes those three, three sins. But what he also does, and I want you to note this, how quickly he also in, uh, encourages us by an action that God takes Toward our sin. And it's there. First one is what? In, in verse 1, blessed. Blessed. What is what is a blessed person? What is it? What is a blessing? David describes.
describes it in a very simple way, does he not? It is the favor of God. Listen, if you've received the favor of God, and we all have, it, I hope I didn't, somebody's breaking into somebody's car. <laughs> but anyway, but when, he, when he tells us that, blessed is those, he's talking to the saved person. We are extremely blessed people. We are extremely blessed. God didn't have to bless us. He didn't have to show us his favor. We were bad characters. We still are. But he, what he does, he in turn, he begins to address those issues in our life when we sin. Now, granted, we must confess our sin. That not leave us to, to assume upon God, to assume upon Jesus Christ. We have to confess that sin. But he's going to show us transgression is one of the first ones. What is a transgression? When, when, and here's what I want you to understand in studying this this week and really praying over uh, areas in my own life. When God begins to deal with our sin, He does not deal with it as under the law. He brings it to our attention under the law, but He doesn't deal with our sin as if it was under the law. He always attends to our sin through grace. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that He deals with us by mercy and grace? I need it every single day. The mercy and grace of God. Transgression. What is a transgression? Intentional sin. Intentional sin. It's an action. It's a breaking away from authority. And when I say authority, it's breaking away from the authority of God in our lives. It's, it's going the wrong way. It, it's, a, it's almost like treason. As repulsive as that may sound, it's almost like treason. Transgression. We know we're doing it. It's like, like me. Uh, I put up signs around my property especially around my pond from one time. And it says, no what? Trespass. No transgression. No trespass. That's what it says. Mary Beth keeps going in there and in and out just like it was hers. But, it's, <laughs> but it is no trespass. And I'm trying to tell them, you're not supposed to go down there. You're leaving a bad example. And if they see you doing it, everybody's going to be doing it. Might as well take sign that. But it's a transgression. It's a transgression against the law. And how does God treat that? He said, blessed is he whose transgression. What does God do with our transgression? Keep in mind, we knowingly do it. What does God, how does God treat that? What does, what does he say he does? He forgives it. Blessed is the man who knowingly sins and confesses it. Blessed is that man because God forgives him. <sighs> the mercy and grace that's in this. And, and, and imagine David, is, is, he's, he's gone through this. He knows what it feels like. And then the second word that he uses is there too. Whose sin is what? Who said is what? Covered. God's action. Sin. What is sin? Well, it's, it's a deviation in our moral behavior, I guess you would say. It's more of a moral thing where we just disregard even a, a child of God sometimes. We disregard that moral uh, action. Sin. How does he do? What does he do with it? God immediately. Listen, when we confess this, it's not a time delay capsule we're taking with God. It is not. When we confess this sin, our sins to God, it is an immediate action upon His part. Immediate. What does He do? He moves to cover the sin. I like this word covered because it points to Jesus Christ. And instead of covering our sins, His blood does what? Washes our sins. 
Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white. As white as snow. Doesn't say anything about covering them. Doesn't say anything about that. Completely cleanses us from sin. And David knew this. Verse 2. Blessed is his man to whom the Lord does not impute what? Iniquity. Does not. Iniquity is keeping a record of things. It's an accounting term. It is keeping a, a point by point, action by action, account of what's happening. And what he's saying is, you know, God could do this. His memory is sharp. He could take this and he could keep a record of this. He says, okay, here, Larry, I don't know how many times you're going to come back having done the same sin over and over and over again. But look what he says. He says the man that comes to God, the person that comes to God confesses that sin. What does he say? This is really good. The Lord does not impute iniquity. He doesn't keep a record of it. He doesn't throw it in our face every time we come to it. Listen, this should make this should make our confession of our sins so much easier on us. So much easier. He said this is what he does. In whose spirit there is no deceit. No deceit. God deals with our sins. He deals with them when we know we have to be completely honest with him. We have to be completely truthful with him with our sin. But when we do that, these are the things that he does for us. And he deals with us completely and he starts us over again, fresh and new. Um, David, my goodness, he, listen, the, the unique thing about David, we need to remember God said that he is what? He is a man after what? My own heart. God said that about David. And he said that about David after he sinned with Bathsheba. It's amazing, isn't it? Listen, we don't understand as much as we need to how we are so governed by the law when we should be extending grace as Christians. We should be extending grace. Why? Because God extended it to us first. And he's, he's dealing with that. In verses 3 through 5, we're going to see how David dealt with his sin and what a struggle it was. In verse 3, this, this sin will make you sick. If, if you keep it to yourself, it will make you sick. Physically. What does he say? When I kept silent, what happened? My bones grew old. Wow, I got that feeling. Through my groanings all the day long. <laughs> Through my groanings. You ever done that? You ever listen to yourself when you get out of bed every morning? <coughs> on the popping and the creaking and all the, that's going on? Mary Beth asked me the other day, said, are you ever going to make it out of bed? I said, I'm trying. I'm trying to give it my best shot. And I do grow. He says, when I kept silent, what's the worst thing we can do with our sin? What's the worst thing we can do? Keep it to ourselves. Keep it to ourselves. Hide it within us. Hide it within us. He says, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. What's he talking about? In verse 4, what's he talking about? For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. God begins to work to convict us of our sin. And it's a heavy hand. If you've ever been there, it's a heavy hand when God begins to work on us. But he's, he's doing it out of mercy and out of grace. And he's doing it to correct us and to make us better. He's moving us toward confession. My vitality was turned into the trial of summer. That's how he felt. As long as he kept it built up within him, it hid his sin. 
I don't think there was any time in my life that I appreciated my dad any more than when I did something really bad. And I finally went to my dad, and I knew my dad, uh, I knew he knew something was up. And I talked, I said to him, Dad, I, I really need to talk to you about something I really don't know how. Because it's going to make you, it's going to make you so angry with me for doing that. And he said, son, I love you. And there is nothing that you can do or say to me that will stop me from loving you. And I heard Christ through my dad. I heard him through my dad. And it was, it was encouraging to me to know that. So my, my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Then in verse 5, he said that I did what? Listen, listen to what he does. Because he, again, he's going he's to say something about sin. He's going to say something about iniquity. And he's going to say something about transgressions. All those things that he fell into, he's going to do what with it? He's going to bring it before the throne of grace. In the Old Testament, he's going to bring it before that mercy seat, I suppose. So that I acknowledge my sin to you. Why is it important that we acknowledge our sins to God? Because he is the one we have sinned against. Against you and you only have I sinned. That's what David said. We sinned against God. But he's bringing him to that point of confession. To repentance, he's drawing us to repentance. I think I heard this this week. Uh, uh, Robert Marks, if y'all listen to him on, on the radio, I would listen to him on my on my way into work every Sunday, and he, he said or every day. He said this this week, and I wrote it down. He said, when we when God is leading us to confession of our sin, to repentance. We have to keep in mind that what he's working on with us, but our part of that in repentance is, and repentance means to change the mind, to change the mind. We need a mind change, and that's what he was talking about. We do that, and that's our part. But when we have that change of mind, when we confess our sin, then God has a major part of that, and it is, and only He can do this. He, he and He alone can change the heart. He and He alone can change the heart. We change the mind through God's help, but He changes the heart. So He deals with it. He deals with those sins. Uh, he's miserable until He confesses sin. You've been there. I've been there. Try to hide sin. You cannot hide it from God. He knows, and He works with us to bring that to our attention. For the main purpose is if we can confess it, and the healing process will begin. Uh, that healing process will come through Jesus Christ. Verse six and seven. He's going to deal with uh, the after. The aftermath of that confession. Uh, love what he said here, David. And this is, again, this is part of that gospel message that uh, David is already in tune to because he knows God. Uh, for this cause, everyone who is God, they should do what? What are we? To pray. Everyone who is godly should pray to him. He said, everyone who is godly should pray to you, God. Uh, go, to, go to God. Go immediately to God. Don't put it off. It's not going to get better on its own. And God will deal with that sin. And he says that everyone who is godly shall pray to you. Listen, one of the things that we can do as Christians for each other is we can lift each other up in prayer. Uh, Boy, there's been times in our lives and in your life that, that we needed to know that there are godly people, there are Christian brothers and sisters that are lifting us up in prayer. I think sometimes, Larry, we need a name.
date and the step up in our lives also? Yes, I do. Uh, you fall, if you've had kids and you've, they got to be to the teenage age, you know you need prayer. You know you need prayer. We never stop being parents. We never. We just get to start over with grandkids. And that's, a, that's a blessing, but we never stop being parents. And we need to be people who pray. And then he says, in, in, in a time when you may be found, there is an urgency to confession that we, we miss sometimes. The urgency in confession is do not put it off. It's the same way in salvation. Don't put salvation off. It's the same way with the confession of our sins. It's in a time when he may be found. When God may be found. It's when he does work in our heart to the point that we know we should confess, we shouldn't put it off. He's our Heavenly Father. We should, we should take it to him. Love it. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. You ever had that time in your life where you just thought you was just drowning? That the flood waters were just, just everything just caving in on you? David says, I've been there and I've done that. Got the t-shirt to prove it. I've been there. But he says, well, the flood waters, they didn't overcome me. God will pick us up if we will pray to Him and He will protect us. We shall not come to you. Uh, verse 7 says, You are my what? You are my hiding place. What does that mean? You are my hiding place. David's telling God. You know, David spent most of it, a lot of his life hiding out in caves, hiding out. Wherever he went, I mean, everybody was after him at one time. And he hid, he hid. And he's, and, but he says this, all those places, it didn't matter. My hiding place was where? Let me ask you this one, where is your hiding place? When this world caves in on us, and it will, and it does, and it has, and it will again. Where's your hiding place? Where's that place of safety? It's not in God. You're in a bad place. You're in a bad place. And He promises us that. So you shall not come, it shall not come near Him. You are my hiding place. And He, David knew, as well as we know when we think about it, God preserves us from trouble. If we're totally dependent upon Him, He preserves us from trouble. I like it. the way he ends this, this part of it. You shall surround me with what? Specific song here. You, you get that? It's not just any old song. It's the song of what? Listen, if you've been delivered, you got a song. If you've been delivered, and we all have, you have a song. And that song is a song of deliverance to God Almighty. Through Jesus Christ. Verse eight's not in, in not in the lesson part, but we, we need we need to take it to heart. That I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. He never takes his eye off of us. Never. No matter how bad we've been, no matter how good we've been, no matter how indifferent we may be, he never takes his eye. Isn't that an amazing thing? How God deals with us once we're saved. But even when we sin, He's still there. Still doing the work in our life. Amen? Amen. Yeah. All right. Anything else? Anybody got a comment? If it's a question directed to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you. I appreciate you because I know you're praying people. I know you're praying people. And we could, we could stand here this morning and one after another give testimony to the fact that
basically what Psalms 32 and what Psalms 51 are for David's testimony of God seeing him through troubled times. That's what it is. And we all have that testimony. We need to share it. Because the world needs to hear it. All right. Nothing else will stand and be dismissed. Thank you for being here again and again. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you, ladies. Mr. Butch, would you dismiss us? Father, we come to you today just to uh, seek your glory and your guidance, and we just appreciate the, uh, all the mothers and the, uh, all their kindness and the way they treat us to uh, deliver us to uh, give you the, the glory for today. Just go with us today and uh, be our guide and uh, just uh, uh, give our appreciation to our mothers. In your name, amen. Amen. amen.